Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in the Holy Quran, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي كَبَدْ صَدَقَ اللَّهُ الْعَلِيُّ الْعَظِيمُ Illuminate your hearts and minds with a very loud salawat. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. As we approach the end of the month of Ramadan, a common question that many people ask, they wonder, we've spent a month bringing ourselves closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A month of fasting, worshipping God, restraining our desires, empowering ourselves over our desires. How can I carry the spirit of Ramadan throughout the year? What are practical steps that I can take to preserve my faith throughout the year and until the next Ramadan? There are many ways in which we as believers can preserve our faith throughout the year. But there is very one important way that I would like to share with you this evening. In our lives, especially here in Western societies, we experience a constant struggle. There is this ongoing conflict. We have to reconcile between two things. And it is not easy to reconcile between these two. It is very difficult. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran that he has created us in difficulty. لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي كبد. The human being has been created in difficulty, surrounded with difficulties. Difficulties are part of our lives. That's why we came here to this life in the first place. And when you experience difficulty, there is usually conflict. Because how are you truly tested? When there is no conflict, when everything is clear, it's black and white, it's easy. You could easily choose the right path. In which circumstances are we truly tested? We are tested when it's not that clear. It's not that black and white. Imam Ali السلام, in one of his sermons in Nahj al he explains why many people deviate. He says because the truth is mixed with falsehood. Those who advocate falsehood, they don't advocate for pure falsehood. Because every human being is smart enough to know what is false. What they do is they mix. They take some truth, they, they take some falsehood, they mix them, they give it to you, you get confused. Usually there is this ongoing conflict. And in this conflict, we have the opportunity to demonstrate our faith to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we're experiencing this crisis, this struggle, this ongoing conflict. Now here in Western societies, the conflict is between preserving our faith on the one hand, and on the other hand, being an active member of this society, there is an ongoing conflict. On the one hand, we are required to be productive people in society. We have to be active participants. We have to engage in civil activities. We have to contribute to our society. One of the qualities of believers are those who constantly are giving to their societies. They're like a you know, fruit tree. Throughout the entire year, they're yielding fruits. They're offering something. They're contributing something. They're benefiting something. These are the qualities of believers. One of the biggest misfortunes that we can be afflicted with is laziness or isolation. I have nothing to do with my society. I have my work, my house, and that's it. I don't care what goes on in society. I don't participate in any social, civil events. This is not a quality of true believers, brothers and sisters. 
True believers are not lazy. That's why in the Holy Quran, we see many verses which strongly recommend us to be active participants at the social level. We need to be social human beings, not isolated. We have this dua in which we recite in the month of Ramadan. Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-kasal wal-fashal. Oh Allah, I seek refuge in you. From what? From laziness, from failure, from lack of energy. If a human being re finds that he or she is lazy, this is not a good indication. Laziness is an indication of weak faith, of weak iman. Not a strong iman. As believers, we have to engage in civil activities. Now, when you become active in your society and in civil activities, there are three primary benefits. You'll also benefit. First of all, when you engage in civil activities, you are contributing to justice, social justice. What is the role of our Imam when he reappears? What is his objective? The objective of Imam al-Mahdi is to fill the world with justice. If I want to help my Imam during the occultation, I have to work for social justice. If I'm isolated, I don't participate in events that my city, that my community, that my neighborhood have. How am I going to bring that justice? You think by sitting at home, isolating yourself from your society, you can achieve justice? What kind of justice will you achieve? Achieving social justice means you have to be out there. You have to be a part of your society. You have to contribute. So you're actually helping the goal of Imam al-Mahdi and you're pre preparing society for his return by engaging in civil activities. That's number one. Number two, when we engage in civil activities, we're actually paying back our society. Because a good part of our success is due to our society. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you the blessings and the opportunities, but how? Through what? You succeeded through your society. You were educated by the blessings of your society. You have a prosperous life mainly because of your society. If you want to be loyal, a loyal human being, you have to pay your society back. Many people, they have this mentality, you know, that all I want to do is benefit and take advantage of my society. You know, they like those, you know, leeches that just suck blood. You've seen the leeches, the worms that they use for medical purposes. The role of this worm in this life is just to suck blood. Some people, that's their role in society. They just want to suck from their societies. They just want to benefit. They don't want to give anything back. As believers, we have to give something back. And one great way is by engaging in social and civil activities. Now the third reason is you're benefiting other people. When you engage in these activities, this gives you an opportunity to help others in society, to bring new ideas, to push your society to go forward and become progressive. And the hadith says the creation of Allah are the people. The people are like the creation or like the family of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Al-khalqu Allah. The most beloved amongst you in the eyes of God are those who benefit his family most. If I just sit home and do nothing and don't participate in my community events, social events, any type of events that goes on in my society, how am I going to benefit other people? How can I truly show my love to the family of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And this brings us to the importance of volunteer work. Volunteer work is very important in our lives. We benefit so much by volunteering. First of all, volunteering teaches you generosity, teaches you how to give, teaches you how to sacrifice. Unfortunately, we see in many of our communities, our youth, Aside from going to school or from participating in religious events, they don't volunteer in their society. The spirit of volunteerism does not exist in our communities. Why? 
you will benefit. It teaches you generosity and it rids you from selfishness. Because you're not working for a materialistic reason. You're not working just to get money, to get an income. You're giving from your heart. This teaches you to be a generous human being who's not selfish. We need to encourage our youth to volunteer at all levels of society. In civil activities, we need to volunteer. And by volunteering, actually, that will give you a great experience in life. All those people who volunteer in society, they're not wasting their time. Not only are they helping others, they're, they're, they're helping their own future. Because that's a great opportunity for us to gain experience. And experience is very valuable in these societies. And tomorrow when you want to apply for a job, you want to go to a good school, if you have that in your resume, believe me, it will help you. If they realize that you're a person who's engaged in volunteer work before, they are more likely to employ you. The school is more likely to admit you. So you're benefiting. Sallu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. The second one for the love of Amir al Mu'mineen alayhi salam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. A major problem that we witness in our communities, you see many members of our community, they are only concerned about foreign issues. Domestic issues, they have no clue what's going on in their society. What are the domestic policies that are being legislated? They have no clue. I know many people like that. If they ever watch news or read what's going on around the world, they only focus on the Middle East or in some parts of the world. We don't care what's happening in our own societies. This is wrong. As Muslims, we, ha we have to have a say. We have to have an active role in domestic issues. At the local level, at the national level, many of us are absolutely absent. When you see there is a domestic cause, and it's for a good cause, for whatever it may be, usually you don't find any Muslims participating in these domestic issues. We don't even care, and most of us don't even know. Honestly, we don't know. I can ask a member of any random community, come sit with me, tell me the last year in this city, in Toronto, in Montreal, in Halifax, tell me the last year, what were the major events that happened in your city? The major domestic issues, the major movements, the major causes. You think they have a clue? They don't have a clue. They don't know what's going on in their society and this is wrong. As Muslims, if we want to earn respect in this society, we want others to respect us, we have to voice our concerns not only with foreign issues, Yes, when we see foreign oppression, we denounce that. But at the same time, we should have a say in domestic issues and domestic policies. Then people will take you seriously. Then people will respect you. Then you could secure your rights. So this is on the one hand. On the one hand, as believers, this is, this is where the conflict arises. On the one hand, as believers, we have to engage in these activities, we need to be productive and a part of our society. But on the other hand, we have to preserve our faith and Iman. We have to preserve our religious values and principles. And oftentimes it becomes difficult to reconcile between these two. Our religion comes as a priority. The priority is not for me to satisfy my society, my family, my friends, my co-workers, my company. No, that's good if you can satisfy them. But my priority is to satisfy Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because at the end of the day, I'll be answerable. Not my family members, not my friends. On the day of judgment in my grave, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not ask my friend why I did certain things. Allah will ask me. No one can come there and cover for you and answer questions on your behalf. 
Therefore, our priority must be Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So how can we reconcile? Because we see oftentimes in our Western societies, it's difficult to reconcile between being active and progressive and at the same time holding on to our religious values. Do I have to compromise my religion to be an active member of society or no? I can hold on to my faith, yet be an active member of my society. This is the ongoing struggle. And brothers and sisters, this is the jihad. This is the greater jihad, the greater struggle for a human being to be able to reconcile between these two. How to be active in my own society and yet at the same time preserve my faith. If I stay at home or go hide in some cave and be religious, that's not an achievement. What have you achieved? The true achiever and the true believer is the one who is active in his society, yet on a daily basis he preserves his iman, he preserves his faith. This is the true believer in the eyes of Allah. You know, one narration says, during the time of Bani Israel, there was a worshiper who used to worship God either in a cave or in the desert. He had spent many years of his life dedicating his days and years only to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One day this man decides to go to the city or to the village to visit his brother. He wanted something from the city. Now his brother was a shop owner. He, he owned a you know, gold shop or jewelry shop you know, shop in which he used to sell gold and jewelry. He goes to visit his brother and as he was going to visit his brother, he was carrying a basket with him. But it was a special type of basket. He went to his brother and, you know, he felt proud of himself, this worshiper. He went to his shop, he told him, look what I've brought. He looked, he saw there was a basket full of water but the basket you know like a normal basket it has holes in it you can't fill it with water but this worshiper was carrying a basket full of water and miraculously the water would not pour or spill from the basket he tells him here i brought this basket with me because i've worshiped allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so much allah has honored me by giving me this miracle now this man did not know his brother. He thought, I'm better than my brother. I have more ibadah, more salah, more worship. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to test him through his brother. His brother said, excellent, congratulations, mashallah. What a worshiper are you? What a faithful person are you? I have one request from you. I need to go do something. Can you run my shop for an hour? Substitute for me. Anyone comes, these are the prices. Sell, I'll come back in an hour. Can you do that? Can you fill in for me? He said, yes, of course. Go do what you need. As soon as his brother goes, a woman comes. You've seen some of those women who go to those jewelry shops. Allahu Akbar. She goes to that jewelry shop and she you know, picks out an item, some gold that she wants to buy. Now as she was picking the item, she extended her hand and the sleeve was removed and she showed her hand to this man. Now this poor guy, he spent almost all his life in the desert, in the cave. He hasn't seen a woman. It's the first time that he's seeing the scene in front of him. So what does he do? The shaitan comes to him, he whispers to him and he extends his arms and he touches her. The minute he does that, the basket spills all the water. The water is no longer contained in the basket. He feels ashamed of himself. An hour later, his brother comes back. He sees the water spilled on the ground. He told him, brother, what did you do? Why did the water spill? He told him, look, I realized what true iman means. And I've realized that you, my dear brother, have greater iman than me. Because I'm worshiping Allah in the desert. In the desert, honestly, how could you sin? You know, there are no temptations, no distractions. 
You, my brother, you live your daily life in the city and you deal with all types of people, yet you've managed to preserve your iman and faith. You're the true worshiper. By being here in this shop, earning a halal living for your family and protecting yourself from sin, from any type of sin. You're true, you're an honest businessman, you fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you protect your desires and chastity. This is the true believer in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is a lesson for us. That if I want to a true, be a true believer in God, I don't isolate myself. No, be in your society. Be an active member in your society. Yet, do your best to guard your faith. Now this brings us to the solution. We have this ongoing conflict. How do I reconcile between preserving my faith on the one hand and between being an active, progressive, successful member of my society on the other hand? What's the secret? What's the formula? The solution, respected brothers and sisters, is very simple. It's difficult in its application, but it's very simple when you think about it. The solution is the art of creating alternatives. And as we think how to preserve our faith after the month of Ramadan, each one of us here, if we want to be progressive believers, we have to master the art of creating alternatives. Because you know what the problem is? Oftentimes we human beings, we run in a straight line. We walk in a straight line. Never do we think of other alternatives, other options, we are presented with a problem, we think, okay, there seems no solution, let's just go this way. Oftentimes we don't, you know, give the necessary effort to find the solutions, to find the alternatives. You know, they say that if you want to run from a crocodile, they say that, I'm not sure how scientifically that's accurate or not. Alhamdulillah, I don't think there are any crocodiles here. But if you want to run from a crocodile, the easiest way to outrun the crocodile is to run in a zigzag fashion, right? Because the crocodile can just go straight. It has a difficulty going right or left or changing paths. So if you go in a zigzag way, you're fine. You'll be safe. The problem is sometimes in our lives, we just see one path ahead of us and we walk straight. And we see no other alternatives. We see no other solutions. You know, companies which are successful are not those companies which have the answer or the solution to every problem. No, these are not the successful companies. Sometimes there are problems, there is just no, you know, ideal solution. Successful companies are those companies which create alternatives. They have plan B. Plan C, Plan D, when something is not working. These are the successful companies. Because Plan A doesn't always work. Sometimes you run into a problem. Simply doesn't work. Fine. It doesn't work, go to Plan B, go to Plan C. Here in our lives, brothers and sisters, as believers, we have to master the art of creating alternatives in our lives. Creating a plan B, creating a plan C. This is the best way. And this formula must be applied at every level of our lives. Just to give you a small example. For example, your kids at home. We see they're addicted to watching TV, going on the internet. You know, they have those iPads in their hands, those gadgets. They're glued to it. And you know how harmful this is for our children. Health-wise, even it plays with their mentality. What do some parents do? Some parents are like, I know what the solution, ban them, that's it. My child is banned from watching TV, from playing iPad, from going on the internet. This is not a solution. Because now the repercussions, the consequences will be negative. Many of our children, I've seen this in very observant and you know, conservative families, overprotective families. You see their children, they're not happy. Some of them feel lonely. They experience depression. And some of them in the future grow up to be antisocial. Don't isolate them from these elements of society. Create alternatives. If you want to ban your child from watching TV 
or from going, you know, vis going on the internet, from surfing the web, you have to create alternatives. If you don't create viable alternatives, then you have failed. You have not offered a solution. If your child is used to being on his iPad three hours a day, the alternative is limit it, make it one hour a day. Those other two hours, you have to fill them somehow. Take your child on a fishing trip, do something, engage in an activity, create an alternative. That's how you deliver a solution. You know, go find some beneficial programs out there. I know I have a friend, he says, he has a daughter who's obsessed, my four or five year old da daughter, she's obsessed with her iPad. Day and night she's playing. When she's not going to school, all she's doing is she's playing on this iPad. And this frustrated him. You know, he thought to himself, what should I do? If I take the iPad, oh boy, you can imagine what will happen to her. So he said, I figured, let me go, you know, ask some friends, let me go search the Apple store and see what kind of good Islamic programs are there. And he found tens of nice, wonderful religious programs. He downloaded those programs and his daughter liked many of these programs. Now, instead of wasting her time on these games, you know, hours and hours of playing, now she's learning, she's educating herself. She's learning the Arabic alphabet using a nice program. She's learning about the stories of prophets and imams and educational programs. There are alternatives. Once we create these alternatives, then we can say we have a solution. Now back to our subject. When I want to be progressive in my society, I want to be an active member, yet, I have to preserve my faith. I have this crisis. I have this dilemma. Because when you want to be an active member of your society, let's say at work you want to be very active. At school with your classmates you want to be very active. One problem that we see in our modern society is that sometimes you have to attend gatherings which are haram. You have to attend a gathering in which alcohol is served. You work in a company. And your coworkers, your boss, sometimes with your clients, you go out to a casual dinner. And you know a lot of the business deals, a lot of important decisions are made in these casual settings. It's not always done in the company, in the boardroom, in the conference room. Oftentimes you'll have to go out with them for dinner and you know how these people are. You know alcohol for them is like your coffee, it's like your tea, it's like your soda, they're addicted to it. They can't have a meeting, they can't have a dinner, they can't have a lunch without it, without wine, without beer, without alcohol. What do you do? On the one hand, you want to be an active participant, right? But on the other hand, you want to preserve your iman because sitting on a table in which alcohol is served is haram in the religion of Islam. How do I reconcile? There's a crisis here. There's a conflict here. How do I reconcile between these two? Sometimes you're invited to a barbecue by your co-workers, by classmates. And the meat is haram. What do you do? Should I go? Should I not go? If I go and I don't eat, they'll be upset. If I go and eat, I'll be losing my faith. What do you do? This is an ongoing crisis that we see. A lot of the people ask me about the handshake, which you're familiar with. What do we do? Every single day we're presented with situations. We have to shake hands with the opposite gender. What do I do as a professional, as a lawyer, as a, you know, college student, as a doctor? What do I do when I'm presented with this challenge on a daily basis? The answer lies in the art of creating alternatives. We have to create alternatives and yet remain active members of our society. Let me give you, share with you some examples. But before we share with, the, with you these examples, it is very important to note, brothers and sisters, that oftentimes we run into such situations because we fail to explain to our friends and co-workers and classmates our religious values. We fail to do that. Oftentimes they don't know about my religious values, about my circumstances, What's permissible for me? What's not permissible for me? If they know, there are many people who will respect that. 
When you're around, when you're part of them, they will observe your own values, your own rights. Oftentimes we fail. We feel ashamed to tell them. I know so many of our brothers and sisters, when they're presented with this situation, they feel ashamed. I'm not going to tell them that I can't sit on a table in which wine or alcohol is served. I just can't. I feel ashamed. It's awkward. They'll see me different. This is wrong. Oftentimes you should make the effort appropriately and nicely explained to them. 60% of the time, 70% of the people, they will accept. They are understanding. They will realize. But oftentimes we fail to inform them. Others do so all the time. They'll let you know what their limits are, what their beliefs are. You know, if they have any do's and don'ts in certain public areas, they'll make it known to you. But it, when it comes to us, our turn, we fail to make it known to other people. And this is a big mistake that we commit. So first of all, we have to explain to them. And then when it comes to the art of creating alternatives, let me share with you some examples. We have to be creative in creating these alternatives. So imagine I have these co-workers and they're, you know, they usually have these casual meetings. Alcohol is served. Sometimes it's a semi-party. You've got music going on. How do I protect myself from such situations? And yet I want to remain an active member in that organization, in my society, what do I do, brothers and sisters? First of all, you have to compensate because you're not attending these gatherings, of course. You have to compensate. How do you compensate? One way of compensating is by forming a bond, a personal bond with those members whom you're working with. Be extra nice to them. Go and buy them a gift every once in a while. Make them feel that you are a human being who cares about them. You know how much difference that makes? They can understand, okay, he may not attend some of these meetings, but look at this person. He's so friendly. She's so nice. Throughout the year, he's giving us gifts. Go out of your way, brothers and sisters, to be nice to them. This is your jihad. You have to sacrifice, yes. Another way in which we can address this scenario, tell them, look, you guys want to get for dinner, right? To discuss this thing. I have another plan. Why don't you allow me to invite you all for dinner? I'll pay for the dinner and I'll bring you the best dinner possible. You think they'll say no? Hey, if you're paying for it, they're going to enjoy it. Even if there's no wine served, even if there's no alcohol, as long as you're the one who's inviting, and you're willing to pay for the cost, and you promise to give them a wonderful, delicious meal. They're not going to say no every once in a while. This is a great way. So yes, you have to sacrifice more. You always have to be the one taking the initiative. But at the end of the day, you've achieved what? You've preserved your faith, and yet you've remained an active member. This is extremely important. Now, if sometimes you can't attend that meeting beforehand, Sit, gather your thoughts, type them out, email it to them and tell them these are my thoughts or have, you know, one of those board members or co-workers or classmates whom you have bonded with, give them your ideas, let them speak on your behalf. There are ways to address it, brothers and sisters. But unfortunately, we make no effort to explore these alternative ways. And this is a problem. Allah says, expects us to be creative and come up with solutions. There's a solution to everything. You're invited to this barbecue event. You know what you should do as a Muslim? Call the organizers or you be the organizer and tell them, look, all the meat, I'll cover it. I'll buy it for you from my own pocket. Not from the companies, not from someone else's, from my own pocket. I'll go and get the meat because I have certain observances that I must observe. When it comes to eating the meat. If you do that, you think they'll say no? If you're being generous and you're offering it, no one's going to say no to you in normal circumstances. There are ways to tackle the situation, brothers and sisters. For example, when it comes to the handshake, be creative and find alternatives. If you're a person who's in the office and every day customers comes to see you, this happens. Many brothers go through this. Many sisters go through this. Be creative. When this person, when this client, when this patient, when this customer walks in, 
obviously many of them from the opposite gender will, ex will immediately extend their arm and hand. What do I do? One solution that you could do, have a beautiful box of sweets in your office. Whenever someone knocks on the door, someone wants to walk in, you stand up, carry the box with your two hands and offer it to them. You avoid the handshake. That's one way through which you avoid the handshake. My point, I'm just giving an example, brothers and sisters. The point of this discussion is train yourself to be creative and come up with alternative ways. There are ways. There are many ways. If you don't have a box of sweets on hand, there are other ways. Before the person comes in, place your hand on your chest. Give them a signal. Let them know. Explain to them in words. Tell them that this is my way of respecting you. This is my way of showing my appreciation for you. And if nothing else works, you know what to do. You, you know, we've discussed that sneeze alternative, but we'll leave it at that for now. You know, remember the sneezing one? Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. I feel like sneezing now. Athaniya ba'ala aswatikum. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. The art of creating alternatives. This is the best way in which to preserve our faith till the following year. We as a Muslim society, we have to create alternative ways of living our lives in a halal way. We have to create alternative sources of halal. Many of our communities fail to do that. You know, for example, when you look at our societies, why is it that we Muslims don't have, for example, you know, sports events that are done in an appropriate way that falls within the guidelines of the hijab and Islam? For example, here in this society, if you want to go to a swimming pool, right? Usually it's mixed. Why can't we Muslims come forward and establish swimming pools which are only for females? which are only for males. Why can't we do that? We have the resources, we have the energy. Sports complexes, we have to be the ones building them for our youth. This is necessary in our society. Why can't we create and establish and found universities and colleges that have an appropriate environment? You, thought, you don't think we have the minds? We have one of the best minds. You don't think we have the resources? Believe me. The Muslims in the West have the best resources. You know, a while ago, President Obama in his speech, you know what he said about American Muslims? He was speaking about Islam in America. And he said that American Muslims have a higher education than the average American. And American Muslims have a higher income than the average American. So don't tell me we don't have the resources. What we lack is determination, conviction, will. That's what we lack. We need to have these halal alternatives in our society. Day after day, our society is growing, brothers and sisters. But unfortunately, we're not doing anything to, you know, cater to this growth. And this is a problem. We need to be thinking in this way. Halal alternatives in our society. And this is the message that we carry from the month of Ramadan, brothers and sisters. If I don't train myself to come up with alternatives, Allah gives me, gives me all these alternatives, yet I refuse to take them. My fate could be like the fate of Umar ibn Sa'd. You know, on the day of Ashura, before the day of Ashura in Karbala, and Imam al Hussein السلام, several times he sent messages to Umar ibn Sa'd. The Imam wanted to meet him. Before the day of Ashura, Imam al Hussein السلام, met him. He told him, Oh, Umar ibn Sa'd, why are you fighting me? You know, Umar ibn Sa'd was the commander of the army of Yazid, of Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad and Yazid. He told him, Why are you fighting me? He told him, Because I've been, you know, promised to, because my home will be demolished because if I don't fight you the governor Ibn Ziyad has threatened me that he'll demolish my house the Imam says 
I'll give you the money to rebuild your house. You see the alternative he gave him? He's like, I'm stuck. He was stuck. Who wants his house to be demolished, right? He was stuck. Crisis. Conflict. The Imam السلام, gave him an alternative. The Imam says, I'll build you your house. He says, but he's threatened to take my village from me, my gardens, my farmlands. The Imam السلام, told him, I will give you the best farmlands in Hijaz around the city of Medina. I'll give you the best farmlands. He kept, um, he kept on coming with excuse after excuse. He was coming up with all these justifications and excuses. He told the Imam finally, well, I've been promised Mulk al -Ray. They will appoint me as the governor al -Ray of this big region. The Imam السلام, told him, look, you are a person whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blinded his heart. And since you've rejected all of my offers and all, the, all of these alternatives that Allah is giving you through me, then realize that Allah will send someone one day to slaughter you in your own bed. And that's what happened. This was his fate and he went to hellfire. He rejected all these alternatives. Brothers and sisters, in this holy month of Ramadan, Allah has given us vision. Allah has increased our knowledge. And through fasting, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us the willpower. And Allah expects us to use this vision and the willpower to try to reconcile between these types of conflicts, between these struggles, being an active member of the society, yet at the same time creating alternatives to pres preserve your faith. We need to think. We need to gather our intellect, share the experiences of one another and come up with an alternative because I guarantee you, if you try hard enough, if you think hard enough, you will find an alternative to every single solution in order for you to succeed in this life. This is our challenge as we approach the end of the month of Ramadan. This is our challenge. Make it a goal that I will master the art of creating alternatives. And I will be as active as I can. I will engage in the activities of my society. I will be a progressive member of my society. Yet at the same time, I will be proud and hold my faith. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised you in the Holy Quran, وَمَنْ يَتَّقِ اللَّهَ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجًا The one who has true piety, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will find you a way.